In the box, hand in in the box, please. Yes. Okay, I think I finally got all this crap set up. Good. So uh, I hope you all had a good Easter weekend and uh, are ready for wrapping up the term here. Um, so I think we have, including today's class, I think we have three classes left. Uh, so what my plan is, is that you will finish discussing our nonlinear fits today. And then in the next two classes, which are, I guess, Friday of this week and Wednesday of uh, next week, we'll talk about one more topic. And it's, it's a pretty easy and fun topic. Uh, and we'll take advantage of some of the stuff we learned about uh, our probability distributions to do that. Okay. So uh, let's wrap up our nonlinear fit discussion. Um, before we get into it, just some reminders. Um, so you you just submitted your lab number five notebooks. And so we'll get those to the TAs and we'll get them graded. Uh, and then we've got assignment six uh, due on Friday. And then your formal report due Wednesday of next week. And then that will be a wrap. Okay. So... The nonlinear fits. So let's just remember what we imagined doing. We had some data that we measured, and we're going to fit it to some kind of model, some kind of function that we created that is some comp some complicated nonlinear function of these parameters that we want to find. Our strategy was going to be to first pick a range of values of reasonable values for our parameters. And then we would construct all possible combinations of those parameters uh, in the box box. Yes. And then uh, we were just going to calculate chi squared and all of those possible combinations, and then find whichever one gives the smallest value. And whatever that set of parameters was, was going to be our estimate of the best fit parameters. And then we started to think about chi squared, and we noticed a few things. Um, we noticed that near the minimum, chi squared had a shape that was quadratic. Sorry, I might sneeze here. So, of course, if you go far enough away from the minimum, then uh, you can deviate from that quadratic behavior. But this red thing is supposed to show that at least close enough to the minimum, the shape is kind of quadratic. And we imagine, okay, let's zoom in to that region where it is quadratic. We said, okay, in that region, we could approximate chi squared in this form. The way we did it, remember, was we ended up writing out like a Taylor series expansion. And we said, well, if we're at the minimum, the first derivative term vanishes. And so there's no a minus a star that's linear because that derivative vanishes near the minimum. So you get the zeroth order term, uh, which is just the value of chi squared, the minimum value. And then the next non-zero term is the one that is quadratic. Uh, so we said, okay, look, there's that red shape. And we decided that if this quadratic very, very quickly, once we moved away from the minimum value, that would be telling us that we precisely know the value of A that minimizes chi squared, and we would expect a small uncertainty. On the other hand, if when we move away from this minimum, chi squared varies only very slowly, 
then we would say, well, we're not so certain about the exact value of that parameter anymore. B is the parameter that determines the steepness of this curve. And so we said, we are going to guess that the uncertainty in our best fit parameter is somehow inversely related to this B. What we decided we would do is, if I want to find out what the value of B is, I could just pick three points near the minimum, evaluate chi-squared at each of those points. We'll get a chi-1 squared, a chi-2 squared, a chi-3 squared, and we could then solve for B, and this was the way that we solved for B. We discovered, uh, by subbing that quadratic form of chi-squared into our maximum likelihood probability that uh, this chi-squared is another Gaussian function. And we discovered that actually the uncertainty in our parameter was proportional to one over the square root. And so that's everything we did. Uh, so that's all pretty like technical, maybe abstract way of thinking about these things. And so what I wanna do is I wanna spend some time to see if we can develop a bit of intuition about what chi squared is actually telling us. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. So today we try to develop some intuition, intuition about the meaning of chi squared. Um, and some of this will be pretty straightforward, actually. The first thing we'll do is pretty straightforward. So first thing we're going to do is notice that if we could say chi squared is equal to aj minus aj star squared over, uh, so it was times uh, b. So what we could do is we could say we could write B as sigma squared. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so if B is the square root of sigma, uh, one over the square root of sigma, then, uh, oh, sorry, let me say. So if B is equal to, uh, sorry, I want to get this right. If sigma j is one over the square root of b, then b is equal to one over sigma j squared. Okay, so we had chi squared was equal to b times this different squared, and I'm just replacing b with one over sigma squared, and then we have a plus chi zero squared. All right, so if this is true near the minimum, of chi squared, what do I want? What I want to think about is what would happen if we took aj and we buried it away from this minimum value? Well, we know what's going to happen is that chi squared will increase. So then we know that chi squared will increase as we move aj away from aj star. Okay, and so what I want to do, I'll draw a picture of that. So here's going to be our parameter axis, aj, oh, it's lost that again. So, screen. Okay, good. So here's our aj axis and our chi squared axis. And we know that somewhere there's going to be a minimum. And so let's say the minimum sits right here. And here's aj star, the value that minimizes. 
And if we go across, then we would find that here is chi zero squared. So what I want to imagine is then we sit at this minimum and then we just move away from AJ star. So we move along this axis either to the left or to the right. In either case, then we increase chi squared above the minimum value. So if we take this point and we move it over here, then we end up with something uh, chi squared that's greater than chi zero squared. And so this is gonna be a translation in that direction. And then of course, we could go the other way and we would see the same thing happen. All right, so what I wanna imagine then is we're gonna do this process. We're gonna move away from AJ star until chi squared is greater than chi zero squared by exactly one. Yeah. Sorry, do you mind reminding me what the significance of the AJ star is? That's just the value of the AJ. These are the parameters that we're trying to find, right? And so in general, we can have M of them. So we have an A1, A2, up to AM. And so this, these are just the set of parameters that find the minimum of chi squared. Star, right? Yeah, they're the best fit parameters. Yeah. So we're gonna imagine that we sit exactly at the position of a minimum, at exactly at the AJ star, and then we just move away from that. And I wanna see how does chi squared increase. So, yeah. Okay. So let's imagine moving along the AJ axis starting starting at AJ star and ending once chi squared has increased from chi zero squared to chi zero squared plus one. Okay, well, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say uh, chi squared is equal to AJ minus AJ star uh, squared over sigma J squared plus uh, chi zero squared. Okay, so that's the parabola parabolic shape. And then what we're going to imagine is then, uh, so we take AJ to AJ prime such that chi squared is equal to chi zero squared plus one. So let's go to our picture here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, this is now AJ prime, just some value of this parameter that's away from the minimum. And we're going to go to this place to where chi squared is going to be chi zero squared plus one. Okay. All right. So then we would have chi zero squared plus one is our value of chi squared is equal to uh, aj is now aj prime. We've gone to some specific value. We still have this. And then we have sigma j squared. And then we have plus chi zero squared. All right. Um, so we have chi zero squared now on both sides of our equation. And so we could cancel that. And we end up with one is equal to AJ prime minus AJ star squared divided by sigma J squared. I could take the square root of everything and then multiply by sigma J. And we end up with sigma J is equal to AJ prime minus AJ star. So what this tells us then is that 
if we start at AJ stock where we're at a minimum of chi squared, and then we move away from that minimum until chi squared is equal to one above its minimum value, then that distance that we move, this difference is an estimate of that uncertainty. In fact, what I should really do is I should really have these in absolute value signs because we ended up taking a square root, right? And so I only want positive numbers for my error estimate. So if we go back to this figure then, what we're saying is that this difference is an estimate of the uncertainty in the parameter AJ. Okay. So in words then, if we move away from the minimum of chi-squared along the AJ axis such that chi-squared goes to chi-zero squared plus one, then the distance moved which is AJ prime minus AJ star is an estimate of the uncertainty in uh, AJ star. Okay, so does that make sense? Um, that gives a really nice, pretty nice interpretation of chi zero and chi squared. It has a minimum. If we move away from that minimum until chi squared increases by one, then the distance that we move is our error estimate. All right. So that's one of the results that I wanted to get to. I wanted to also see if we could come up with a prediction. If, if we measured a set of data and then we did a nonlinear fit, what should we expect for the value of chi squared? Right? We haven't talked about like what is there some number that we should expect to get? And so that's what I want to deal with next. So what should we expect as a, or let's for a value of chi squared after doing a, let's say a good fit. Okay, so let's remember the definition of chi squared. It was the sum of i equals one to n. So we've made n measurements of some data and we're gonna take the difference between the i th y value and the y value calculated from the i th x value. And then we're going to Divide that by sigma i and then square it. Okay. And we have to assume that we've measured xi and yi plus or minus sigma i for i equals one to n. Okay. So let's let's do a plot of sort of what we might expect for our data. So here's our x-axis, here's our y-axis, and then maybe we have some, this is our best fit line, and then we fit that to our experimental data, and our experimental data looks something like this. Okay. 
Okay, so something like that. Our data in general are close to the line, but they don't always intersect exactly that line. Okay. So on average, how much would you expect the deviation yi minus y of xi to be? So let's say on average, we expect the deviation at yi minus y of xi to be approximately equal to what? What would you guess that you would roughly expect this difference to be equal to? You know, if it was a perfect fit, every point was exactly on this line, the difference would be zero. But we're never going to get that. So what would you guess you typically would get? Yeah, the sigma i, right? So that's what you're, you know, when you're estimating uncertainties in your y measurements, what you're trying to do is you're trying to predict how accurately you could me make these measurements relative to an exact model. So it would be plus or minus sigma i, right? If we've made reasonable estimates of the uncertainties. Okay, and so that's true. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to then say, therefore we expect chi-squared to be approximately equal to, well, it was the sum of i equals one to n, we have to divide by sigma i and then square. And now what we're saying is that we think that typically this difference, this deviation that we always talk about should be plus or minus sigma i. And so then we get plus or minus sigma i. Obviously the sigma i's are gonna cancel. And so you end up with a plus or minus one, but it's squared, so I don't care about the sign. And so if I did this sum, what should I expect? N, yeah. And so that's, this is sort of a half truth. If you take a large number of measurements and then you do a fit to your data, if your fit is any good, you expect chi squared should be approximately equal to the number of data points. So that's the first result. So for n large, a good fit to a data set will yield chi squared is approximately equal to n. All right. So yeah. Why does n have to be large for us to work? We're gonna oh. we're gonna do that. Yeah. Okay, um, now let's, let's think of some other possibilities. What would happen if you've made, like if you badly overestimated your uncertainties, uh, you badly overestimated your sigma i values, right? So your, your error bars are really big. What's going to happen to the value of chi squared? They'll be too small, right? This difference, y i minus y of x i, that's still going to be the same. Um, but if you're dividing by an overestimated uncertainty, then that ratio on average is going to be less than one. And so when you add them up, you're going to get a number that's less than n. Yeah. Is that ratio kind of like what they call the R value? Uh, yeah, I just, I don't strictly know how they calculate the R value. Um, I'll look it up. We're going to talk about eventually a reduced chi-squared and that will yield a value of one. So that's where we're going with this. 
So um, if um, you find that chi squared is significantly less than n, it probably means that sigma i has been overestimated. I could draw what that would look like. In that case, you would have, I'll try to draw the same picture, x, y, what was the shape? Something like this. And so let's imagine that we have some data points that kind of follow this trend, but you know they don't land on the line exactly everywhere. Uh, but then if you've made four estimates of these uncertainties, that plot might look something like this. And you know you can see from this drawing that the deviations are like typically the size of my finger, but the error bars are the size of my hand. So that when you take the ratio, you're going to get, instead of a ratio of close to one, you're going to get something that's much less than one. And you add up all these things that are less than one, and you get a value that's less than n. OK. Um, a third possibility is that you end up with uh, a chi-squared that's much bigger than n, or let's say bigger than n. So if chi squared is larger than n, whoops, than n, it could be an indication that your model does not capture all of the features present in the data. And I could draw what that would look like. Um, so let's try x, y here. And so uh, this time, what I'm going to do is I'll draw like a model that maybe looks something like this, right? Just some kind of smooth function. And then I'm going to make some data points where maybe there's like a little feature in the data that's something like this. And so maybe we've made some reasonable estimates of our uncertainties. It looks something like this. Okay, so what we could find here is that all of these points in blue are going to give deviations that are close to one. So the points encircled by blue contribute approximately one to chi-squared. But then we have these points in red where we have large deviations so that when you take the deviation divided by the uncertainty, you're gonna get a contribution that's bigger than one. And so the points encircled by red contribute more than one to chi squared and such that the overall chi squared is going to be greater than n. And this may indicate a poor fit. And all of this assumes that we have a reasonable estimate 
of uh, the sigma i values. Because what, what's another way of getting uh, chi squared bigger than 10? Let's say it is a good fit to the data, but you still get chi squared bigger than 10. What could happen then? Yeah, you underestimated your uncertainty. So these deviations are, you know, typically what they are. But if you're divided by like a really small uncertainty that's badly underestimated, then you'll get chi squared bigger than 10. So if you've made reasonable estimates of sigma i and chi squared is bigger than n, it probably means that there's something in your data that's not captured by whatever the theoretical model that you're applying to it is. Uh, and so that could mean that you've made some kind of discovery of new physics or something like that, or it just means you're using a bad model, okay? Uh, and so for this reason, we can think of chi squared is a goodness of fit parameter when sigma i is estimated appropriately. Okay, and so your question is, why did I put the stipulation of uh, large n there? And um, so what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to show why that is the case. Okay, so let's try and figure this out. So we're kind of shifting gears a little bit, just a bit. So expecting chi squared approximately equal to n is correct when n is large. Well, sorry, when n is large. So however, let's consider the following extreme cases. So the first extreme case is, uh, I want to imagine that we're going to try to measure the density of some fluid, right? It's a really easy thing. Uh, we take a beaker, we fill it with some fluid, the beaker allows us to measure the volume, then we put it on a scale, uh, we zero out the mass of the beaker, and we get the mass of the liquid. And then, of course, we could calculate the density as uh, mass divided by volume. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to measure the volume of an object. It could be a fluid or just a block of wood or whatever. And measure also its mass. So then we calculate, or we, let's say, determine the density row from a fit to the data. Okay, so of course, I could just take my mass divided by the volume and get the density. But what I want to do is I want to think of this in terms of fitting so that we can relate it back to chi-squared. So our theoretical model is then that the mass is equal to rho times v. And so what we're going to say is this will be our y data, v will be our x data. So our, we set the volume, then we measure the mass, and then this will be our fit parameter. This is going to be the slope. So M versus V has a slope. Uh, let's say B is equal to rho and an intercept of zero. Okay, so this is a one parameter fit. 
And so we're trying to fit for the density rho and um, with uh, n equals one data points. Okay, so it's an extreme case because we have just one data point. The better way to do this measurement, if this was we're measuring the density of a fluid, would be to pour a bit of fluid into the beaker and measure the volume and the mass and add a bit more, measure the volume and the mass, add a bit more volume and mass. And maybe we get 10 or 12 data points, we plot them and it should follow a straight line and we put a straight line through that data. That would be the better way, but let's think of doing just a single measurement. So what we end up with is a plot where we're gonna have volume and mass, and we make one single measurement, and here's our V1 measurement, and we end up with our M1 mass, okay? And so we get our one data point right here, and maybe we make some estimates of the uncertainty in the mass that we mentioned, something like that. Okay, now, what would if I was trying to fit this? What would the line look like that I would put through this data? It would what? It's going to have zero intercepts, so the line will pass through here. It has to pass through zero. Where where what else is the line going to pass through? That point exactly right. And so if I pass this through exactly this point, this is my best fit line. And really the main point here is that it passes directly through our single point. If our line passes exactly through that point, what's the chi-squared gonna be? What's the deviation between this line and this point? Zero. Zero. Okay, so if we have only a single point to fit to, then the deviation at yi minus y of xi is going to be equal to zero and Therefore, chi squared is equal to zero. All right. So now let's think about this. Like, if we make only a single measurement, we're not going to get exactly the true value of the density. Um, all we're going to do is we're going to just make an estimate. Like, maybe this is the true value. Uh, say M star at V1. So if I measure the deviation with respect to the true value, which of course I don't know, then I will get I squared that's not equal to one, or sorry, not equal to zero. So the issue is that our best fit line is biased to be artificially close to our measured value rather than to the true value. And because it's biased to go through our measurement, we measure our chi-squared that's artificially too low. So that's the main takeaway from this little argument here. So since, um, since our best fit line is biased to pass exactly through our single measurement, the calculated chi-squared value is artificially low. Well, in fact, it's exactly zero. If we could 
calculate 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 chi squared using the true value of m which i called m star called m star in the figure then we would get chi squared is approximately equal to one, which is equal to N in this case. So this is actually, if you think way back to the beginning of term, this is kind of like bookending the term a little bit. We talked about briefly the standard deviation and we said sigma squared was gonna be equal to uh, one over N minus one times the sum of say x i minus mu squared. And we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about what is, why is it n minus one and not just one over n? And the reason is that the mean, the mu is calculated from the set of data. And so you're choosing your mean to be artificially close to your actual measured data points and you're not using the real value of the mean because you don't know it. And so that results in a standard deviation that's a little bit too small. So to correct for that, you divide by not one over N, but a smaller number, one over N minus one, which pushes the standard deviation up. And so it's the same thing here. We don't know the true value of M star. And so we underestimate the chi squared when we do the calculation. Okay. Um, the correction is to say that the value you expect for chi squared is not n, but it's n minus the number of parameters that you're fitting to. In this case, if we're just finding the slope one parameter, which is the density, then you would expect to get n minus one. And that's exactly what we got for our one data point, we got zero for the chi squared. So the resolution, which I'm not gonna justify formally. So the resolution is that the expected value of chi squared is not N, but is n minus m, where m is the number of parameters in your fit. So for uh, an n equals one, for n equals one and a one parameter fit. In this case, our one parameter is the slope or density. We expect chi squared to be equal to n minus m which equals one minus one, which is equal to zero. And that's correct. So going back to the N large case, like if we take a thousand data points, like often it's, it's these days when you conduct an experiment, it's usually automated. And so you have some equipment logging data for you. And so N equals thousand is no problem. You can do that easily. And then if you're gonna fit that to I don't know, a uh, two parameter fit or something like that, then, you know, a thousand minus two is still approximately a thousand. So that's why I said for n equals large, pi square approximately equal to n is about right. Strictly speaking, it's n minus m, the number of data points minus the number of parameters. Yeah. What if you have more parameters than the data points? Then you can't solve that. Yeah. Yeah, so if you had, it's like saying, what if I had 
six unknowns and four independent equations, I can't solve for those unknowns. It's the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the number of data points. And this is the number of fit parameters. Okay, um, so what I wanna do in five minutes is, okay, I was gonna do the, the another case, but let's just summarize this findings for chi-squared. So chi-squared summary. Okay, so we expect chi-squared to be approximately equal to, oh, you're taking a page out of Eric's book. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Expect chi-squared approximately equal to N minus M. Okay. Uh, usually, um, we call N minus M equals to new which is the number of degrees of freedom. So that terminology is a little weird, but it makes a bit of sense if you think about it, because think about our one parameter fit to one data point. So there was no freedom in choosing our slope. Our slope had to go through the intercept of zero, and it had to go exactly through our data point. <laughs> right? So there was no degrees of freedom. And so that's why nu was equal to zero. If on the other hand, we had a whole bunch of data points and one fit parameter, then our degrees of freedom becomes n minus the one in that case. Okay. All right. So we expect chi-squared to be equal to the number of degrees of freedom, n minus n. So if we make reasonable estimates of uh, sigma i, then chi-squared greater than n minus m means r indicates a poor fit. Now, if your number of degrees of freedom is like 998, right? Say we did a thousand measurements and we have two fit parameters. So we expect chi squared to be 998. If we go and do the measurement and we, we come back and it says chi squared is 1,005, I would still say that's pretty close to the number of degrees of freedom. It's probably a good fit. But if you get chi squared is like 2,000 or 3,000, like two or three times bigger than you expect, that's when you begin to worry that you've gotten a poor fit to your data. Uh, and then the last thing that we said is if chi-squared comes out to be less than n minus m, then we've probably overestimated the values of um, sigma i. Okay, the very last thing I'll write down in this last minute is that Often when you do these fits, software will report um, either chi-squared or the reduced chi-squared. So the reduced chi-squared value is um, denoted chi-squared nu, and it's equal to chi-squared divided by nu, which is equal to chi squared, divided by n minus m, the number of degrees of freedom. And so in this case, we could go back and we could say, we expect 
then chi squared uh, reduced to be equal to one for a good fit. Chi squared reduce that's greater than one is an indication of a poor fit. So some software will report chi squared. There, you want to compare that to n minus m, uh, the number of degrees of freedom. If your software reports the reduced chi squared, that's what you want to see get close to one. Okay, and so that's why it's called the fitness of fit parameter. Yes. Is this what's happening in sign six, where the error value is actually constant as you're smaller than Um. Oh yeah, I guess. I don't know. Like the reason that I said anyone who could tell, explain it to me, you could get bonus marks because I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, strictly speaking, the chi squared is the way we're estimating the uncertainties is not through a calculation of the chi squared, right? We had this yeah. covariance matrix where we took the diagonal elements. Maybe they're related in some way. Um, I'm not sure if I had to guess is I would probably guess that maybe what's happening is that the data that I made up is not completely uncorrelated. So remember when we were doing the uh, error propagation, we ended up with these covariance terms. My guess, and I don't know if it's true or not, is that Python is using those off diagonal terms, which are the covariances, and those are somehow incorporated into how the error is estimated, but I don't know how that works. Yeah, okay, good. So uh, that's it for today. We, for anyone who's doing a makeup lab, I will be there in a few 